Hi guys. It is an exciting first Saturday night in Florida. That would be Saturday night, November 5th, 2023. As I have strayed off the beaten path once again to wind up at the end of this dirt road. And uh, where I have, <laughs> as you might have known by now, if you're still with me, have managed to uh, bring to the end of this dirt road at age 64 a copy of a manuscript of a story I wrote when I was 21 years old. 43 years ago I wrote this story and I honestly don't know how it turns out. It's been so long. But anyway, this is Maurice and the Rainbow Maker. Maurice and the Rainbow Maker. Seven chapters long. And uh, this is chapter three. Straying from the beaten path. <clears throat> Maurice decided it would be best to stay on the trail as long as it was heading west. At least it would keep him from walking in circles. The path crossed under the old barbed wire fence at the edge of the meadow, and Mo found himself in a deep forest where the sunlight spilled through the leaves, painting spotted patterns on the ground. Everything was bathed in a warm green glow. <clears throat> Mo was glad to be in the cool shade again. The dirt under his feet was cool and moist. It reminded him of his bedroom back home. Thinking of his bed, Mo became very sleepy. He found a much needed drink of water in a cold, clear spring that bubbled up from underneath a clump of frilly ferns. Mo lay down on a soft mass mattress of moss. He was asleep in less than a minute. Mo jumped up when he heard a loud noise in the forest. He was sure he had heard somebody yell. He listened carefully. Ouch! He heard someone scream. Mo looked toward the sound, and there he saw the strangest sight he had seen yet on his journey up above. <clears throat> stronger than a stranger than a talking mushroom, stranger than a rock eating blackberries, stranger than a watermelon pink horse. What Mo saw was a man dressed in a dirty white robe stumbling through the thick woods, stumping his toe on every root and banging into trees. <clears throat> he was stumping his toe and banging into trees so much because he was blindfolded. <clears throat> Sticking out from under the man's blindfold was a big nose with an almost as big purple bruise in the middle of it from banging into so many trees. Maurice knew how that hurt. He felt sorry for the man. <clears throat> Mo couldn't figure out what, the, what was going on for the life of him. Here was a man who lived up above, where there was so much light, one never had to bang into trees. Yet this man chose to live in darkness. Amazed, Mo watched the man stump his toe three times and bang into six more trees. Ouch, the man yelled every five seconds. Mo saw the man was about to fall in the creek. Stop, yelled Mo. There's a creek five feet in front of you. The man stopped and turned toward Mo. Who's there, he said, trying to peek through his blindfold. My name is Mo, said Maurice. Don't worry, I won't hurt you. Oh, I'm not worried, said the man, brightening. Nothing can hurt me. 
Moe started to say that he'd seen the man hurt himself a dozen times in the past five minutes, but he decided that wouldn't be smart. Begging your pardon, said Mo. Why, may I ask, said Mo, but, but may I ask who you are and why you are wearing that blindfold? My name is Blind Faith, said the man. He offered his hand for Mo to shake, not realizing that Mo was a four-inch tall mole. I wear this blindfold because I have faith in the trees to take care of me. <clears throat> trees are much stronger than people, so they are people's masters. So if people put all their faith into trees, the trees will let no harm come to them. In fact, if I could put every bit of my trust into these noble trees, they would even steer me around them. I've almost gotten to that point, in fact. But I've seen you smash into a dozen trees in the last ten minutes, said Mo. So you have, chuckled blind faith. But tell me this, how many trees have I not run into? The man changed the subject before Mo could answer. Tell me why you're in this forest. Mo told Blind Faith his long story of how he'd entered the forest while searching for the Rainbow Maker. Tell me, Mo, said Blind Faith, do you really believe you'll ever find the Rainbow Maker? Well, I hope so. Oh, but do you have faith, my boy? The man asked in a booming voice. Yeah, I guess I have faith, said Mo. Then you'll find the rainbow maker, bellowed blind faith. Faith is all you need. Nothing else matters. Faith is fine, admitted Mo, but faith alone won't help me find the rainbow maker if I don't know where to look for him and don't know how to recognize him if I do see him. Nonsense, my boy, yelled the man. Have faith, and you shall find whatever it is you seek. Now go, be on your way, and let me be on mine. Mo was glad to be on his way. He was barely ten feet out of sight of the man, when he heard a huge splash and an ouch as blind fate fell blindly into the creek that was right in front of his eyes. Maurice was sorry when the woods started to thin out. The trees became smaller and there were a lot of small bushes dotting the area. Mo wished he could find someone to ask about the Rainbow Maker. High hopes and faith were about all Mo was left with. A swift movement up ahead caught Mo's eyes. He, he stared and a flush of excitement ran up his spine. There, a few feet away, sat a lizard. And it was no ordinary lizard either. This lizard mostly glowed, softly glowed, all the colors of the rainbow. Red one second, blue the next, violet the next. Mo knew he had found the rainbow maker. At last, he rushed toward the lizard. The lizard, who had never had a mole running after him, started running away, flashing all different colors. Stop, yelled Mo. I'm not going to hurt you. I only want to talk to you. The lizard stopped, turned a deep plum red, and waited for Mo. Are you him? Mo asked with trembling voice. Do you mean, are you he? Corrected the lizard. Besides, am I who? For should I say, am I whom? 
he glowed in mid goldenrod yellow. Are you the rainbow maker? Asked Mo, growing impatient. <clears throat> the colorful lizard laughed. I guess you could say that. My name is Cody, and I am a chameleon. Us chameleons, I mean we chameleons, can turn any color in the rainbow. He flushed a bright iris blue. I found your piece of the rainbow, said Mo, <clears throat> thinking the rainbow maker would be thrilled. My what? asked Cody. You know, the piece that fell out of your rainbow earlier today, said Mo. I'm afraid you have a wrong number, buddy, said the chameleon. I change colors, but I don't go around making rainbows in the sky. You don't? Mo asked, crushed. <clears throat> he held out the piece of rainbow to Cody. Do you mean this does not belong to you? The chameleon turned a pale shade of green when he saw Mo's piece of the rainbow. That's nice, said Cody. He turned a brighter shade of green, but it wasn't all that pretty. It fell out of the rainbow, and I know the rainbow, rainbow maker wants it back, explained Mo. If you let me have it, I'll take it to the rainbow maker, said the chameleon. He was now throbbing an ugly shade of green. Maurice was getting nervous. Oh, no thanks, Cody. I'll take it to him myself. Mo started to leave, and Cody, now so bright green with envy that Mo couldn't even look at him, <clears throat> tried to block his path. Mo grabbed his piece of the rainbow and ran with all his might. He ran and ran and ran. He didn't stop running until he was totally out of the woods and once more in rolling fields. What fantastic fields they were. <clears throat> the well-traveled path led through. Green grass wasn't all that grew in these fields. Mo passed a field on his right that was full of thousands of books of all sizes and subjects. A tiny trail cut off and led toward the books. Mo waited Mo wanted badly to follow the smaller trail, but he told himself he'd better not waste time by getting off the main road. That was obviously leading somewhere more important. <clears throat> Next, Mo passed a field on the left full of bright paints, paint brushes, and modeling clay. Again, he wanted to follow the tiny trail that led to them, but again, he decided it would be safer to stay on the main trail. <clears throat> Mo stuck to the big path as it wound through many more fields of opportunity. Fields of cars, fields of exotic plants, fields of test tubes. Maurice was so tempted to go blow a shiny brass tuba that was growing in a field of music that he just about stopped off, stepped off the main trail to follow the tiny footpath that went down to the instruments. But again, he stopped, afraid to leave the main trail. As Mo walked, the fields of opportunity became drier and more barren. The trail itself became rough and rocky and full of muddy ruts. It was slow going and it was ugly, but Mo could tell thousands had passed here before him. Please don't hurt me anymore. Mo heard a feeble voice cry as he was picking his way around a rut. Mo stopped and looked around. Ouch! You're standing on my hair, the pitiful noise cried. Where are you, Mo asked, 
terribly upset that he was hurting somebody that he couldn't even see. I'm right under your feet, sobbed the voice from right under his feet. Mo quickly jumped back. Ouch! Now you're on my nose! <clears throat> Maurice did not know what to do. He hated to be the cause of so much trouble, yet he didn't know anything to do with his feet. He couldn't fly. He wasn't a bird. Who are you? He asked. I am the beaten path, explained the voice. It was having a hard time breathing because Mo was still on its nose. He jumped off and luckily landed on the beaten path's chin. The beaten path told Mo its sad story. I've been here for thousands of years and millions and millions of feet have walked over me. I've never figured out where all those feet could be going. There were so many other nicer paths through so many beautiful fields of opportunity, yet every, yet very few folks take them. I've been beaten ragged over the years. I'm old and ruined after so much time and so many feet stomping me, yet the, the feet still keep stomping on me as old and as wretched as I am. The beaten path cried a few weary, dusty tears, and Mo hopped as lightly as he could off the trail. I won't hurt you any more, beaten path, said Mo. I promise. I always used to dig my own tunnels down below, so there's no reason why I shouldn't blaze my own trail up above. But before I leave, could I ask you just one question? Could you tell me where I could find the Rainbow Maker? Oh, how I wish I could, but I don't know myself, sighed the beaten path. I've lain on my back so many times and watched rainbows arching freely over me. Like me, rainbows stretch from one place to another. <clears throat> Some folks even say there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but I don't believe it. Unlike me, though, rainbows are free to fly through the air, dance with the clouds, and shimmer different colors of the sun. And unlike me, rainbows don't know the pain of so many feet or the age of so many years they don't stay around long enough to grow old. The beaten path started to weep some dusty tears, and Maurice was sorry he brought up the rainbow maker. The brave little mole turned away from the beaten path with a silent goodbye and stepped into a field where few, if any, had ever gone before him. Maurice felt a little uneasy about leaving the beaten path, but at the same time, he was a little bit excited. After all, no one he met along the way had known where the Rainbow Maker lived. He decided to keep heading west by following the sun. The sun, it would be setting shortly, and up above would be dark as down below. He'd soon be smashing into trees like blind faith, hurting his nose again. And he knew it would be even harder to find someone who knew of the rainbow maker at night because folks who were awake only at night had never seen a rainbow. There were no rainbows at night, just as there were no rainbows down below. Maurice picked up his piece, picked up his pace as he needed to find the rainbow maker by dark. <clears throat> he was getting quite upset too. Mo became so upset and started walking so fast that he didn't even see the beautiful woman in the long emerald gown sitting calmly by herself in the middle of the field. He smashed 
right into her. Oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am, Mo apologized furiously. I didn't see you sitting there. I wanted so badly to find the rainbow maker by dark that I wasn't paying any attention where I was going. Oh my goodness, I've dirtied your pretty dress. I am so sorry. Please, interrupted the lady politely but firmly. Please, I'm fine. I assure you there's no harm done and no need to get so upset. My name is Calm. I'm pleased to meet you. My name is Mo, said Maurice. I'm pleased to meet you, too. Tell me, Mo, what brings you to be running through my field so late in the day? Calm smiled softly and lazily wove a stem of clover around one of her fingers. <clears throat> Mo launched into his tale of looking for the rainbow maker. Calm had to allow him, had to slow him down three times when he became too excited. I'm sorry I can't help you find the rainbow maker, said Calm, but I can give you a nice place to sleep tonight as you can, so you can feel good on your journey tomorrow. Please stay. Thank you, said Mo, but I really must be going. I still have about a half hour of light and there's so many places yet to look. It was so nice of you to... I, I understand, laughed Calm. I know you're a busy little mole. Goodbye. Maurice hurried off across the field. The field suddenly turned into a dark forest with a lot of tangled underbrush, dead trees, and rotting logs. Just as suddenly the sky filled with hulking black thunderheads, wicked bolts of blinking lightning shot across the bulky clouds, followed by growing grumbles of rumbling thunder. Then the rain started one drop, two drops, then a million drops. The rain poured so hard that Mo could hardly see. It was a cold rain, too. Mo was very scared. Somehow, the cold and wet little mole made it into a small cave under a big boulder. It was little more than a shelter and it was cold and full of cobwebs, but at least it was safe from the rain and lightning. Mo huddled in the corner of the cave, trying to warm up. Just as he felt some heat returning, another chill came over Mo, but this chill wasn't due to the rain. Mo had a chill because he knew he was not alone in the cave. Nervously, Mo glanced toward the roof of the cave, and in the evening's last light, he saw hundreds of pairs of beady eyes staring back at him. Behind the hundreds of pairs of piercing stares were hundreds of horrible little creatures hanging from the ceiling like bats. Some were green and scaly with pointed heads and ears, and, and they had noses like pigs. Others were fat with stringy black fur all over their bodies, but there wasn't a hair to be seen on their heads, and the rest were little more than slimy gray gobs with eyes and mouths. They were all hideous, and Mo was terrified. Maurice could barely read a sign at the mouth of the cave. This cave property of the creeps, willies, and heebie-jeebies. All trespassers will be scared to death. Maurice was already half scared to death. He wasn't about 
to talk to the creeps, willies, and heebie-jeebies. It was bad enough having to sleep in the same cave with them. He wished so badly that he'd stayed longer with calm before the storm hit. He wished, too, that he had followed that small path that led into the field of music. But it was too late for that now. He thought about high hopes in his promise to keep her alive in his heart and head. He thought about his molehill, his mother, and his own warm bed. But most of all, Maurice thought about the rainbow maker and how worried he must be about his missing piece of the rainbow, clutching the piece of rainbow to his furry, thumping heart. Mo drifted off into a troubled sleep, which brings us to chapter four, a chapter I am well aware of in my own life, in trouble. Mo has now landed in trouble. Yeppers, and uh, we will have to continue with Maurice and the Rainbow Maker tomorrow because it is going on midnight. And I have a busy day up above tomorrow. Buenas noches. Bye, guys. Okay, little dog.